Puerto Rican kid, bald head, loves snakes, loves Blizzy, Sergio Chacon. Yeah. Yeah. What up, Pa? Peace, peace, peace. Welcome to the BBS podcast. It's your boy, Sergio Chacon, a.k.a. Blizzy Chacon. That shit's whack. That means always gonna be dirtbag shit podcast. The DBS podcast. Peace and welcome to the DBS Podcast. This week I am joined by a very special human. (laughs) I call him a human in the highest regards because he's a humanist, he's an activist, he's a dope-ass comedian. And during our Zoom in, we spoke about a friend of ours who passed away, Mr. Angelo Losada. We had to give peace and tribute to him. We spoke about going on the road with some of our friends who are some of the best comics in the world. We spoke about the state of comedy during this time, we spoke about his album, Stay At Home Comedian, which he dropped during quarantine. How dope is that? Without further ado, please enjoy my man, the very funny, Mr. Ted Alexandro. You got me, Serge? Yes, sir. You look uh, great. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. I, re- I really do love the power of uh, allowing you to come into the room. It's just like, Teddy's waiting. I'm just like, I'll wait. I'll wait 20 minutes. <laughs> and then I click, and then you pop up. There it is, man. Take what I you can think, get, right? What's that? I saw, take, you gotta take what you can get these days. For sure. And you know what's bizarre? I was thinking to myself, <laughs> two minutes ago, I was running water over my head, <laughs> and, now, <laughs> and now I'm here. You know, it's like showbiz has changed so much. Like if you were gonna do somebody's podcast or a show or some, like you'd have your like your best, you know. I would have got my shit together. I'm like, all right, <laughs> let me just re- put some water on my head and uh, and I'm ready to start. <laughs> just water in here for no reason at all. Just threw water on your head. Yeah, I'm doing this podcast with just a t-shirt on. I'm sorry to share that with you, but it's just a t-shirt that's much too short. But because the the frame is up through here, I'm good. good. <laughs> yeah, man, you know. You know, we're pulling, you're pulling out your third string, your fourth string wardrobes, right? <laughs> yeah, this is like the real deal, like uh, scheduled for a physical meeting. You would have had to block this whole day differently. Right, right. The yeah, whole I day mean, would have been different. Yeah, it's crazy, right? On the one hand, like you fit, you fit a lot more in. Like I've been doing obviously a, a lot more podcasts, my own stuff, other people's stuff. But you're not leaving your house, you know, so it's uh, it's strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ted, I love it. <laughs> yeah, man. Me too, right? I was oh, yo, I like quarantine. <laughs> yo, I enjoy it. Same. Like honestly, I don't think I've felt this clear headed, strong, both mentally and physically, in a very long time. I, I'm at my best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was saying to my wife. Earlier today, I'm like, I might not, I might never leave the house again. <laughs> yeah, man. You're nope. glad that I'm concerned, of, you know, for the obvious reasons. But right. I'm making, man, I am enjoying myself, man. I'm with the family. It's a big enough place where I can hide from them. I could do this work on the side. I get to work out. I got virtual clients that I only have to deal with for a half hour. Yes. You yeah, know. no, it's, I mean, all of the, uh, you know, kind of, dark sides put aside, you know, obviously, right. You know, the city, the country, we're dealing with a lot, but as far as the individual impact, you know, thank God everyone's doing well, healthy in my family and immediate family, stuff like that. And obviously you hear about different people. uh, So, you know, yeah. So that, that is uh, upsetting and impactful, but yeah, as far as like the, the smallness of my life, and also, I mean, you have a daughter. I have a three and a half month old boy. Right. I've been home every day. I've been home every day at this this crucial part of his development. Waking up with him, seeing his smile, you know, playing with him. I'm like, I'm good, man. I'll yeah. stay here forever. <laughs> yeah, I know that's right. You have a, a baby boy who's like six hours old. You just had him. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas Day, man. I, yeah. I remember. I remember. Congratulations so I did- to you and the wife. Thank you, thank you, yeah. So, you know, I, I had done like a few road gigs, um, my own stuff and some stuff opening for Jim Gaffigan, where, you know, like you're gone, 
you know, even if it's Thursday to Saturday, Friday to Sunday, that's a long time to leave a newborn, you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there was a couple days in like late January, early February where I, I got back out there. And, you know, I mean, it was kind of that mixed feeling of like, on the one hand, it's nice to, to be doing what you love. It's nice to be, you know, on the road with my friend and everything. But, uh, you know, the, on the other hand, it's like, it, it, it pains you to leave this, this little, this little being, you know? So in that respect, the quarantine, like, you know, you can't leave. So it's, it's just been great to, you know, to be like a father who is here and doing, doing everything, not everything, but you know, uh, my, my wife obviously still does more. She's breastfeeding, right? but, uh, doing, doing a lot, you know, a lot more than I would if I was going on the road every weekend. Right, right. And the thing is, we enjoy what we do, right? I mean, shit, yeah. you're on the road all the fucking time with your with with, with Jim, who's a, a, a amazing comic. He's probably your best friend. You guys are like best friend, and you're hanging out fucking sold out stadiums doing stand up. There's probably like like the underlying guilt as <laughs> right, <laughs> like you're having a good time, and it's like you got this newborn. It's like you love what you do, but then you feel like a little bit like. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it too, man. You feel conflicted because, you know, like... But you are I'm, working. You're working. Yeah, it's I'm working. You know, I mean, and plus, you know, we've been at it a long time. So, like, the personal history that Jim and I have known each other for probably close to 20 years. Yeah. Kind of came up through the game in New York City together. So, we have a lot of personal history on top of just, like, you know, we both know what we're doing on stage. We enjoy what we're doing uh so it's like a good kind of uh working marriage relationship so that we just it, it's like a, it's fun like you said it's fun so but you do feel pangs of guilt where you're like i'm leaving my wife with with our baby boy and i'm going to like you know go have a nice steak dinner after the right, show right. And, you know? I, I could picture i could picture you talking to to jim about this too as he cuts his steak he's like i, I did it seven times over don't worry about it. You'll be okay. Because doesn't he have like seven kids? He's, he's got five. Five. He got, yeah. he, got, he got more kids than Old Dirty Bastard. <laughs> Him and Old Dirty Bastard are like competing. If that would Old be Dirty a Bastard hard. was still alive, that would be like a good, like, who's going to win the race? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And he is, he's very much like, oh, you'll get old, you know, like yeah. after, after two, three, four, he's at five. Uh, yeah. He's like, it's all new to you. So he, he yeah. understands. But that's good in a way, too, because I can kind of bounce things off him. He's yeah. been through the ringer. He's a, he's a vet, man. He's a vet. He, his oldest is, is like, uh, I think, 15, 16, and his youngest is maybe five. So, uh, yeah, so I can kind of bounce things off him. So that helps, too. Yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. I kind of picture, like, you know what a new, like a new comic comes into the green room and they're all, like, tiptoeing around. That's the way you're tiptoeing around fatherhood. Like, is this the right thing? And, and he's just like a grizzled comic. Like, you'll be fine. You'll, you'll, you'll be fine. Well, you know what's funny too, man, is like, you know, I'm not a kid. I'm 51 years old. So on the one hand, you know, I've, I've lived life. But on the other hand, like I have respect for, you know, guys like you, you, you know, you're younger than I am. There's plenty of guys younger than me that have kids. And uh, I have this newfound, I always respected fathers, you know, uh, but I have this newfound appreciation, man, for people that are like figuring out the career thing and, and, and just putting all the pieces together that you have to in life. And then raising a child on top of it, I have this whole new respect for people like yourself that have, you know, have been doing this, man. I'm like, wow, you know, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I'm sure I could have done it when I was in my 20s, 30s, but uh, I'm kind of appreciative in a sense that, I, that I'm doing it as an older guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, you, I've always thought, and I have thought about this, I guess dudes don't really talk like this, but I'm different. <laughs> I've always thought you'd be an amazing dad. And oh, the reason why I even thought about that is because you used to have a bit talking about, and I remember this story kind of like, leaning against the wall, like, don't have any kids. I did it. <laughs> you, you know, like, when I heard that, Ben, I heard, I heard you work it. Uh, and I remember like, that's so fucking funny. And that wasn't even a joke. It was just like, that was your premise. And then you went into it a little more. But I remember thinking when I heard that from you, Ted would be an amazing pop. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he would be a good dad. So after that show, I thought about going up to you and asking, Ted, would you be my father? <laughs> Please. Please, Ted. 
I, 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 I'm constantly sorting out your knowledge. I need it. I need some guidance. <laughs> That's a done deal, man. You, you know, I got I got the little one now, and you could be my you could be my older kid. <laughs> I keep on asking to bring up the kid, like, Serge, I got my hands. Yeah, full. I kind of got my hands full. You know, <laughs> like, you can text me from time to time. <laughs> oh man! But you know what? It's funny that you mentioned that because, like, uh, that was like um, kind of it was the title of my my second special. It was called "I Did It." And it was mm-hmm. based on that joke of just like making it through the maze of life. And I don't have kids. I'm not married. I did it. You know, I'm happy. Life is good. But I reconnected with my wife. We had dated, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and we, you know, I had always loved her and kind of thought in my mind, like she was the one, but we kind of just went our different ways. She was in fashion, working all over the world in Italy. Uh, you know, she was in Puerto Rico for a time. So, I was kind of like just living my life and enjoying it. And then she, uh, she, you know, texted me out of the blue a few years back and we reconnected and, you know, I knew like, I knew I loved her back then. I knew when she texted me again, I was like, all right, here we go. And, uh, we wound up getting married. So, you know, it was just, it was the timing of everything, you know? And so, you know, as much as I celebrated being that guy and being in my forties and single, now I love being in my fifties and and married. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I feel like um, it all from the outside and it all happened so quick, but it didn't. I mean, you know, you and and your wife were, were knew each other for years. I didn't know that, you know. And I, I was interested in finding out about that. I was like, yeah, I, I you know, out of nowhere, it feels like Ted is a it has a family and it's like, <laughs> so wow, you guys knew each other for years. You were like, what do they have that I don't have? Why can't you be my <laughs> Why can't you be my dad? <laughs> I was like, you know, Ted Pop just decided one day he wants a kid and a beautiful wife, and look what happens. Good for you, Ted, right? <laughs> Give me one second. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's this, you know, I, 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 own, I own a zoo, right? I, I look to my right, and I just see, it's just a, a big pit bull head coming out the side of the kennel. I'm like, maybe I should let her lose before. <laughs> do you, are you an animal guy Ted? do you have any animals you know what like i did i'm one of five kids i have two brothers two sisters and my parents would never let us get a dog or any pets or anything so i'm a little i wouldn't say scared but like skittish around like I, i'm fine now with dogs and you know, like my old roommate had cats and stuff so i kind of grew into it but as a kid because i never had a dog like a lot of my friends did and they were like, you know, playing with it and all licking it. And, stuff. <laughs> and I was always like, you just, know, I never had that. Just tussling with the dog, just tussling. Like the dog is biting their neck. They're like, oh, oh. They're yeah. falling in the dog's mouth. Yes. It felt so foreign to me, all of it. I was like, on, in the one sense, I was like a little bit envious of it um, because it all seemed so fun and kind of like primal, just getting in there with a, you know, with a dog <laughs> and like, rah, you know. But uh, I was scared because I, you know, I just didn't have that experience, you know. Right, but I got right, better right. As, as I got older. But my, yeah. you know, my bro- I know you, ha- uh, you're into snakes, and my older brother has had snakes over uh, his adult life. So you know, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with holding snakes and all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I, I love nature, but yeah, yeah, I just didn't grow up with that experience. You know, I, I, I just picture a younger Ted in someone's house who owns a dog, and your arms are just, you don't know what to do with your arms. It's just like. <laughs> that's that's probably why you got the cadence to grab the wall. <laughs> this, this wall is nice. I need to be somewhere safe. <laughs> Which, by the way, that's the way snakes behave. Is that right? Yeah, they always like to have their body against something that sh- that they feel security that way. Man, so maybe yeah, that's they, like- snakes never like to be in the middle of a of a uh, uh, of a room like with nothing to grasp uh, how far they are from something. They like to constantly be pressed against something, the side. They always like to be coiled in into tight little holes. It's a sense of security. I mean, there's noodles with eyes, essentially. <laughs> Some of them get 33 feet long, but for yeah. the most part, they're very shy creatures. They don't like anything above them because that kind of uh, gives them the feeling like a hawk is in a, a predator's above them. Yeah, um, yeah. So maybe that's so, uh, maybe my spirit animal is a snake, actually, man. Maybe 
Maybe I've been missing out this whole time. <laughs> just a, just a, a little garter, a garter snake, I, you know, just yeah, guy who, eat, who, who feeds on goldfish every so often, you know. Yeah. Just put your head in the water. <laughs> right. <laughs> just get what I need. <laughs> Nothing what, what poisonous. Kind of snake, just... What kind of snake did your brother own? Do you remember? Man, uh, I don't remember. No. Was it remember. a bigger one or a smaller one? It was pretty decent size, you know, it would be like around the neck and um, kind of had like those, like a scaly, like a scaly exterior. Um, well, most snakes do. They, yeah. They're <laughs> <laughs> that's, me, that's me being sarcastic. <sighs> that's right. me being ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, had, it was a snake that had scales. <laughs> it was pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> and it went like this to the tongue. <laughs> yeah. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> did he have it for the entire life or did he go on Craigslist and get rid of it? <laughs> you know, he had it, uh, he had like two different ones. And one of them I remember got lost for a while. I don't know if you've had this experience, but it got lost. I'm responsible. In the huh? I'm responsible if that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I got out the enclosure. It got out of the enclosure and uh, he, it was like he couldn't find it for, I think it might have been a month or something, but I guess because snakes being what they are, you know, he was feeding it like, I guess, mice and stuff that he would yeah, get yeah. from the, from the uh, pet store. But yeah, and then, it, and then it just popped up one day, you know, it was still alive and he found it like behind something. And, uh, but yeah, he's had it for, I would say like maybe the last 15 years or so, he had two, oh, wow. different, two different snakes. And uh, one of them, I think, was going blind in recent years. Oh, wow. I just love to hear stories like that, because I feel like reptiles are the sort of animals that are like a novelty. They're good for like the first year or so. Then it's like you got this 20-gallon tank that's slopped in the middle of your apartment, and people get rid of them, you know? Yeah. I feel like yeah. reptiles, you know, people don't – it's very rare – that uh that people keep reptiles from like the beginning to end and it's like oh who wants my snake you want something you know get me. <laughs> i feel like that's the way people are for reptiles yeah well he, my brother really loved his snake um his name was orange julius because uh he had like kind of orange like an orangey tone you know yeah it uh, might have been a corn snake it that might be it i have to ask him i'll get back to you but yeah <laughs> but he um he really loved it, man. Because he also, you know, my my brother lives alone, so it's like also that kind of aspect of you know companionship and just yeah. coming home from work and and you know uh, something alive is is home. So it was real. It was a real part of his life. You know, it was like yeah, yeah, his, yeah. Uh, his baby. <laughs> it's, it's you know you know I'm gonna text you about that the the breed of that snake. You're gonna be busy with your with your son. I'm like, hey Ted, just following up. Uh, you got the species of that snake that we were talking about at some odd hour, two o'clock in the morning. Hey, Teddy. You said you were going to get back to me. What's, what's up? <laughs> hey, uh, ask, our conversation, I'm just uh, following up. You just leave me on when is, good, when is a good time to Zoom chat so we can follow up on the <laughs> You know, I have to tell you, man, because uh, I actually, I messaged you this uh, a while back. You posted, uh, I think it was like Valentine's Day, around Valentine's Day, maybe of 2019, maybe of 2018, but you posted something on, uh, on Instagram that, I, you know, I think you were kind of joking, but, you know, I think you were also passing along some words of wisdom from your own experience, and you were basically telling people to fuck. You were like, get out there and procreate, you know. Uh, it's challenging, it's difficult, but it's the most rewarding thing, so just stop it. Don't overthink it, just fuck and have a kid, you know. And it, and it made me laugh so hard. But it also, like, you know, in, in some way, it really spoke to me, it really touched me. And then, like, when we got pregnant, I was like, fucking surge, man, like. <laughs> I found the godfather. I know who the godfather of this kid is going to be. It's going to be Dirtbag Surge, who told me to fuck. <laughs> Stop well, thank you, man. <laughs> you made oh, it happen. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I probably, did I write, did I write fuck or did I write fucks? Because if I wrote fucks, I definitely got that from my late dear friend, Angelo. He always said fucks when yes. in referring to things that he liked to take part of. Yes, yes. He was like, 
like you know, if he went to uh, uh you know, to see the Knicks, he'll be like, oh, I fucks with Knicks games. I fucks hard, yeah, I fucks yeah. hard with the Knicks. <laughs> and there was always F U X. So yeah. I told him, I said, I love it. I'm using that. I, I, I like to. I fucks with fucks. <laughs> so you mind if I fucks with it, Angelo? <laughs> Did he come up with? Was that Angelo's? He came up with that. Well, he came up with Fox, like, so, and I just loved using it. So I didn't like, know that. I assumed it was like just out there. That was yeah, it. Well, maybe yeah, maybe it was just out there. But he owned it, man. I like okay, when yeah. he used it because he no, it was I, like F U X, and he will fucks with things hard. Oh yeah, I, no, I I, to I totally associate that word with Angelo. You know that, and uh, I always remember anytime he posted about Trump. He called him a, a, an ape or a gorilla. <laughs> an, wait, 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 an orange ape. An orange ape. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've laughed thinking about Angelo, you know, and missing him and thinking about, yeah, how we would call him an orange ape. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you, you would just, every time I, the name Angelo just comes out of anyone's mouth, I just picture a guy with a blazer on, perhaps a water, just, you know, looking up, you know, like this, because he had that 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 uh, those mannerisms, like just kind of like through his thick glasses, just kind of that's right, surveying everything. Kind of, <laughs> and then he say something witty, and just carry on, just, just <laughs> move on. Yeah, man, and like like you and and I, uh, he was a New York guy too, you know, like yeah. like there's that kind of fraternity uh, of of New York people born and raised. You know, I think he was the Bronx, right? You, right, you, right. Manhattan, Lower East Side. Yeah, and you're so, Queens, right? Queens, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like, you know, uh, there aren't that many of us that are from like the the boroughs. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, and he, he, he absolutely loved you. Many times we've been on the road and he will, um, although I would say this, we all, you know, <laughs> he, he, he threw around the word brilliant very loosely, but when okay. pertaining to you, I was like, I give him that. But those last times he was on that bullshit. I was like, <laughs> maybe, because, maybe because he never called me brilliant. <laughs> yeah. But he... I have no problem with it. I have no problem. <laughs> yeah, you were like, no, I think, I think he was pretty spot on when he was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, he absolutely loved you, man. We, I remember just recently we were out in Florida and we were, and we were talking about you. And, you know, he was like, no, Ted is a beast. And we were talking about how you just turn over new material all the time. I mean, how many um, comedy specials have you produced on your own? You got like a nice catalog, which I'm like, so impressed by. Thanks, man. Yeah. Most I, I recently, have, uh, Stay at Home Comedian, which you just did during quarantine. Yeah. I put out an hour special shot in my apartment. <laughs> That's fucking you know, awesome. I, thank you. I was live streaming every night, like so many comedians. I've been live streaming throughout this on Instagram live at night and uh, I was calling him Teddy Grams and I just thought I like to myself, it. you know, like a lot of these uh, bits that I'm doing, cause you know, uh, when you've been a comedian a a as long as we have, like sometimes it just comes out as like a, a fully formed bit or, or close to it. And uh, that was happening enough over the course of the month that I was like, let me go back and, and watch. Cause I was saving all of them. Nice. So, Smart. Uh, yeah, so then I just went back, watched, and I had like an hour of stuff that I really liked. And especially since like this time is so specific and we're going through this all together and it's so weird and we're processing this new world and shit, I thought like, yeah, let me, I mean, it's going to be kind of silly in a way because it, obviously it's not like a well-produced uh, big spectacle, but uh, I was proud of the material. So I said, let me put this out as a comedy special. So I, I made a stay-at-home comedian. That's awesome, man. So how many um, live sessions would you say you put together before you found the body that you said, this is it? I would say uh, the idea probably first occurred to me like maybe a week to 10 days in where there were enough things that were kind of making me laugh that I was like, you know, and especially because it's different than stand up because it's like it's off the cuff. It's just extemporaneous. And like things were coming out that I was like, oh, that's, you know, I wish... And plus you miss, as a stand-up, we miss being on stage too. So there were things I, I was like, oh man, I wish I could develop that or, you know, kind of just uh, see what, what would happen with that. But in, uh, in another sense, I was grateful that it was just this ephemeral thing of here it is, it's out and uh, let me put them together. So I, I think I knew like maybe, you know, a week, two weeks in, 
that I'm going to, I'm going to assemble the, the funniest things, the things that kind of speak to me, uh, you know, a mixture of like the funniest or the most, I always like to just put in like some interesting, like thought provoking stuff that, you know, maybe it's not as funny, but it's also like a little bit of a, you know, like a truth bomb, like something that just makes people think a little. So, you know, right. I put like some of that in, but I, I try to always just keep funny up front, you know? Right, 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 right. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm proud of that, man, because like for me as a comedian, as a creative person, and I, I know you're like this too, like, you know, if I'm inspired to do something, if I have an idea that excites me, I just want to see it through, you know, like I want to like get on it and do it and, and execute it. Um, and that's, that's the fun stuff for me, like stuff yeah. that like, it's not coming from a manager, it's not coming because I'm getting paid, whatever, you know, I mean, that's nice too, but when it's like something that's organically like an idea that you hatch, you know, I'm sitting there in my, in my uh, living room doing these things. And I'm like, let me make this a comedy special. It's kind of like a little odd. It's ridiculous, but I think it's quality. So um, yeah, man. So I, I, I was proud that I, w you know, I did it with my producer, Matthew Weiss. He, you know, he's directed my last two specials. Um, and to your earlier question, I've done, uh, let's see. <clears throat> excuse me I've done this is my fourth special so I did um uh the first one was as much as you want the second was I did it uh the, that we talked about earlier right, the third right. was senior class of earth and then the fourth was a stay at home comedian and I'm working on a fifth now that I, I was actually working on before quarantine started um just from all my sets at the cellar uh putting together another album. So I have like an hour. Uh, I don't know if it'll just be an album or I'll also put out the video, but I, uh, at the very least, it'll be, it'll be my fifth album. So was it going to be a collection of different bits you did at the cellar and just tied them together or you were just working it out and then it was going to be like an event where you just did all the material you're talking about and then produced it like that? Well, this is actually, uh, this is stuff that is like finished. Uh, like it's bits that I've been doing for the past couple years. Got it. And that like, you know how as a comedian, you kind of have a sense like this is done, it's ready. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, like th this is stuff that's polished, ready to go and done. Uh, but I'm also thinking about going back. I have sets from like, I didn't put out a special from the years like maybe 2008 to 2012 or 13. Too busy oh fucking. I was too busy fucking. <laughs> that was around the time I dropped that uh that Facebook post. You're welcome. That's right. <laughs> I fucks with fucking. <laughs> so I uh I put out uh you know I had put out um as much as you want in like you know maybe that was two thousand five two thousand. I remember that and I the 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 cover was it you sitting down with your feet fully extended and your no, no, that was I did it. Ah, okay, I did it. Yeah, so yeah. that was more recent. Yeah, I remember that. that. Was more I'm recent. Coming to that one. As much as you want, I was in prison uh, with like this big guy who kind of looked like me now. Um, but I that, do remember that. It was just like yeah, yeah. So a lot of that stuff was from my. Uh, I had done two half-hour specials on Comedy Central, right? In like late '90s, early 2000s. So that was kind of some of uh, each of those two specials was on uh, as much as you want. Okay. So nice. yeah. So now there's this, like these lost years where I was kind of, you know, again, like being in quarantine, I was looking back at some of my old uh, hard drives, like the videos. And I was like, shit, man, like I never put that joke out. I never put that joke, you know, like this stuff is never on an album. So uh, I'm going to comb through like those lost years. And I, I, if I have something that I think is worthy of an album, I'll put out like the lost, lost album. Yeah, yeah. Dig in the archives real quick. And that's very, that's very Queens. It could be co called like the Lost Tapes because Nas had a, um, an album like that. It was called the Lost Tapes. That's right. And I think he put it out like in a cassette. <laughs> or maybe the, the CD cover had a cassette on it. I don't know, but it was cool. Some yeah, of it, <laughs> it was, some of it was a little dirt bag. It would just be like one verse. I mean, that's it. <laughs> and move on. I was like, yo, that shit is gangster. I like that. <laughs> yeah, man. I think my special is going to follow that, that model. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah like I like a, that, right? Just like a setup, no punchline. Yeah, yeah. Sounds <laughs> like my, my entire set. <laughs> 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 That's, I'd be like, heaven, 
I rely heavily on my physical attributes. Uh, <laughs> but well, I, I feel is, that's my strong suit. <laughs> I feel the same way, sir. It's like, don't you feel as though, like, if you have a joke that's working, but then you can put like some physical behind it, you know, it it just it adds that layer, like a facial yeah. expression, the body, and you're great at that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, yeah. it really is who I am. You know, a lot of times I could punch it up by doing something with my face or body, and it's just. When I'm like on with my friends or family, it's just how I communicate. So yes. it's like at my best, I'm my most comfortable. I'm doing that on stage. Yes. You know? Yes. But it, it's actually it's actually interesting. Um, I look back at like the earlier times. It's not I was definitely pulling the trigger a lot more on that stuff. But now I try to be a little more structured with some of that. And there was a difference in how I did stand up, especially because there was like a couple of years where uh, I stopped drinking. Well, I, I still don't drink, but I remember like having to deal with that too. Like I was, I called myself like thinking a little too much. So it was like, it felt, it, it might have not been that long, but it felt like two years or a year and a half, I had to figure that out. You know, like yeah. what yeah. I'm comfortable doing, you know, like. Right. So, yeah. Cause sometimes. like a learning process all over again. You know? Oh yeah. And sometimes when you're on stage, you know, there's those moments of just like reaching for the, for, for, for the life raft or, 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 you know, reaching for something that are a safe, safe ground. And, you know, so if you know that your physical will, will do that for you, you do it. Or sometimes yeah. for some people, it's like their volume, they, they, they yell or, yeah. uh, you know, whatever we all have kind of our, uh, our tools and our, you right. know, not tricks, but the, our strengths, you know, but yeah. But, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, there's nothing worse <laughs> than being overly animated and that shit not working. Like doing the act out <laughs> and the, you're just on the floor on your back, your legs like this. And it's like the crowd is just like sucking their teeth. All you hear from above is <laughs> <laughs> I always say to myself, if somebody <laughs> winds up on the floor, <laughs> you better be sure there's laughter because that's going to be yeah. a, a long time. You got to get, you, you, you got to get, you got to get back up. <laughs> So if they better be rolling, man. They better be and rolling. Like, and no one's helping you get back up. They're going to be looking at you, pushing that negative energy down, like, S -s stay down there. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you see people get up real slow because they know they, they took the loss. <laughs> oh, man. And honestly, I haven't seen that in a long time. But I do remember, like, oh, someone bombing on the act out. I can't even remember the last time. I might have. I'm, I'm sure I did it before. But, oh, man, that is is the worst. I, just, never, I wish I could remember one recently. Like have you sure, have but... you you've done that where you you wind up on I've never I don't think <laughs> no. I've ever wound up on the floor <laughs> totally on the floor. No, I'm not on the floor. That was an exaggeration. But it does when you do any act that it doesn't work. It feels like you're on the floor. It feels like you know maybe you got caught on a check hook and you're like oh and you know your legs give out like a baby giraffe. You're like oh <laughs> yes. It's like it's like if you're not gonna meet me halfway, I just did <laughs> I just did my big you know I gave I worked for it. <laughs> but it's just not the idea is nothing yeah yeah that's so funny man that's so funny but yeah no but guys like you i've always looked up to you know i i, I love you, the way you maneuver on stage and you know correct me if i'm wrong either you or angelo said it it might have been angelo about you but it kind of like <sighs> shit i might be intertwining something you were explaining but if he angelo if i'm not mistaken and Correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you, you mentioned this about in reference to your style of comedy. Um, but he did say you're kind of like an instrument and how you kind of build it together and like the notes play and how you work up into it. And the way he said it was so much more eloquent and articulate, but it made perfect sense. When I watch his stand up, it's like you take your time, you know, you touch something, it's like, I know where I'm at. It's almost like a boxer, like on his toes, just filling it out, putting that jab out there. But you know, I know where I'm at. You know, just touching, touching, and then his hold that one. You know, like a Pennell Sweet Pea Whitaker, like hold that. Okay, now we got another one coming. You just don't know when it's coming. All right, let's you know. And that's you know, every time I see you, I I I'm like uh, excited about it because that's the way you kind of maneuver on stage. Was that something you say that uh? You always, you always felt that was a, I can't even ask you that question because I know the answer to that. You, you weren't always like that. That was something that developed just of years with confidence and just training. That's what it is. It's reps. 
Yeah, yeah. I, wa I watched Sweet Pea Whitaker. I got into that low crouch. <laughs> Remember Sweet Pea? Yo, which by the way, this is dirt bag, and I don't. This fucking guy, no one can touch him. And then he dies by getting hit by a bus. That's the most ironic dirtbag bullshit. Yeah. He gets hit by a bus, Ted. He, tr he probably tried to get low. <laughs> <laughs> a bus? <laughs> I know, Come on. man. Oh, that guy was one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, man, he was beautiful in the ring. I mean, that was boxing. And that's he was like, beautiful. He was. It beautiful. was absolutely beautiful. He was light on his feet. He would go low. He, the thing is that with Sweet Pea Whitaker, he will make you miss and then pay. It wasn't just like a defensive thing. Like, you do something at him. He's in a crowd and gets, like, whack you like a cat. You know, like, bang, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, you he, talk about control, too, right? And, and I think it applies to the stage, too. Um, yeah, so I, I always admired that about, about his style. Uh, like, just consummate tactician, control, control the pace, control the ring. Um, and yeah, for, for stand up too, I think like my style definitely evolved over time. Cause when you're a young comedian, you know, like you're just trying to get laughs, you're trying to figure it out. So if you have any joke that works, you get your first five minutes, you cling to that for, you know, for a year or two. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think over time, you know, like I learned to slow down a little bit and, um, to really like be present on stage, not just be reciting an act you know like right, really right, be right. there so if i have a tangent that i want to go off on um because like you talked about with like touching the wall or whatever like just walking around, like moving the stage using the stage uh i think that came over time and you know you're always communicating to the crowd even if you're silent uh if i'm just leaning on the wall i'm kind of communicating like control you know like i'm not in any i'm not in any rush i'm not nervous you know right. uh i'm not trying to like bore them but i'm just trying to like i'm taking things at my pace you know and i think that's a good thing for any comedian like no matter what your style you just want to communicate i'm doing my thing at my pace so that but that takes time you know it probably took me like 15 20 years to really feel yeah, yeah. like i owned it yeah and that's how angelo touched on he was like you know, it's kind of like an instrument. Like he, you, you, you choose the notes you want at any given time. You know, I wish I could text this motherfucker. I forgot what he said. Oh man! <laughs> Yo, how long does someone have to be gone before you delete them from Facebook? <laughs> Not Angelo. Angelo's with me for life, but I got a couple of dead friends. I'm like, how long? You know, like Yo, I'm reaching that five thousand cutoff mark. You know what I'm saying? I'm tired of seeing your two picture from two thousand in the Fubu shirt. <laughs> And then Facebook reminds you too, like they pop up like on their birthday or some shit. And you're like, why are you bring these ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And then you look at, you, you look at that, the shitty, the, the, the last shitty post. They're like, oh God, that's how you went out? Jesus Christ. You went out playing Candy Crush? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, man. It's so crazy. I, let, me ask you, let me ask you about, uh, cause you had such a journey with Angelo uh, you know, and and with Giannis, you guys were like almost like a band, you know, like yeah. you guys were making, talk about music, you guys were making music <laughs> together. So is that like kind of one of the, uh, you know, like one of the highlights of your career so far, like the journey that you took? I, I, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. You know, one thing you said earlier that just kind of like stuck with me and hit me and in this conversation was uh, when you're out with Jim Gaffigan, you're, you're hanging out with your friend. And we're, you know, and we're doing stand-up comedy. Are you kidding me? Like, the moment I take any of this shit for granted, yeah. and I'm just like, oh, you know, oh, I got to get on a plane. Oh, break up. You know, I check myself real quick. And yeah. I'm at a place, I think it's age, and I also think it's this patience and, you know, having a clear head and just having a good concoction of very positive things in my life that allow me to really appreciate that because, Holy shit. Yeah, that's the highlight, man, because I'm hanging out with some of the funniest motherfuckers in the world on the road and we're just, you know, being silly on stage with some shit that we've been working on, you know, and there's like a, a system to it. But also, I'm always going to be a fan to you. I'm always going to be a fan to Giannis. I'm always going to be a fan of Angelo. So being part of that and taking it all in, it feels good. It's like the enthusiasm really goes away. If, if that enthusiasm ever like wavered, maybe I need to do something else. But to see Angelo and, and Giannis 
in the green room, you know, orchestrating something, you know, you know, in regards to maybe Giannis's characters. Because no, Giannis had three characters sometimes. And that including his own stand-up. And that was crazy to see. If I would see, I would so Angelo was a beast of a host, go up, bang, 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 do his crowd work. You know, tied it with some dope material. The crowd will always be on board. It was rare that Angelo started off slow. Set me up beautifully. I do my time. Sometimes Giannis would go up first, with, with, you know, like as himself. And that's hard to do because you got to understand, like, these, uh, these characters were really popping, especially Maurice at certain times. So, but he wanted to introduce people to Panos. So now he got to switch gears, put on the mustache, panos, and then Marisa. And like just them talking in the green room, getting him ready for the next character. It was all very interesting. And I, I, my admiration for both of those comics on the road doing some of this stuff, or even in the city, like grew immensely. I was like, yo, that's beastful. Like I had an easy job. Angelo set me up, I do 15, 20 minutes. Like, you know, look at my finger, I got a pit bull, you know? <laughs> you know? I'm having fun and, and, and doing the job, but what these guys did, I've always thought was special. Because yeah. and that, that, that kind of thing, there's no replacement for just the years, right? Just the years of, of Angelo becoming Angelo on stage and, and just like knowing, being in every situation, hosting all over New York City, all over the country, all over the world, so that he brings a certain skill set and like you said, especially as a host, like that he can really bring a room, like uh, uplift. And then Giannis, like his skill set, you know, so it's, it is like a, it is like a band. I keep going back to that. Like you guys are all playing your Yeah, man. I mean, these, you know, and I, I'm really giving it like the, the, the fact is essentially, man, is two man comedy. You know, like when you get the or Giannis on there with Panos or Maurice or one of those characters, because you got to believe that's the character. Yeah. You, and that's that's a skill. Like, you know, someone else, you throw any other comic who we like in that situation, they'll be like, what is Janice wearing that wig for? You know, like in the back, <laughs> in their mind, even though they, they think it's funny, that they, they, they're just not in it. Yes. Angelo was in it. He believed it. And that's a skill because that's like an actor. He yes. was, you know, but it didn't feel like acting. You know, no. like it never felt like, oh, he's playing this role. Like you believe that shit. And that was special. And anytime Angelo spoke to anybody, it felt like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And this yeah. is thrown around heavily um, by comics. And, and I just, I have to, you know, say it again. It's like, Angelo was in a room, uh, you know, you know, you were never alone. He addressed everybody equally, you mm -hmm. know, uh, but he would give you some shit, you know, he would, you know, he was a beautiful person that way. He was just like in tune to everybody. Yes, and yeah. when you lose someone like that, I mean, I've always appreciated it. But when you lose that, it's like there's not a lot of people like that, and that's a it's a beautiful thing. I'm not, I'm like, yo, I didn't know that shit was available in the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the Bronx bread shit like that. <laughs> yeah, no, he had like this deep kind of, I guess you could say, love of humanity. Yeah. You know, he had a real love for people that came across in his stand up, a real respect as a baseline, you know, and not that like he wouldn't fuck with you or that like, you know, he didn't have that as part of like what he could do too. As a comedian, you need that. But uh, yeah, he just had a real warmth that was kind of his core that like, as soon as he came out on stage, you know, whether you knew him or not, I mean, we had the added advantage of knowing him as a friend, but there was like this warmth, warmth that pervaded, uh, that he communicated, you know, that, uh, that really was, his core. Right, right. That's exactly right, man. He, um, and I, I just loved when, when, when they had the memorial for him. I mean, it was just well done. I, yeah. and, and, and his life is being celebrated. I love talking about him to people, yeah. you know, huh. and, and he, he's, a, he's just a dope individual. So, yeah, I would say a, a, a lot of the highlights of doing comedy definitely involved Angelo and Giannis. And most recently, I mean, I've been on the road with Chris a lot, Chris Stefano, yeah. and he's such a great, great guy. So it's been a lot of fun, you know. It's just yeah, it's just been a lot of fun. So I, I always the uh, the moment I ever feel 
like, oh, this is too much or whatever. The, the biggest, the biggest problem is, and it's my own shit, is creating content that I, I feel good with. I feel good doing the podcast and shit. And like you did with your IG live and, and put together a body of work, you know, for the present time, which is art. It's a recording of the time, which is so dope and appropriate. You're good at pulling the trigger with stuff like that. My thing is creating has been such a slow process. Although I've been putting a lot into the podcast and everything, I do hope that this will allow to piece together some more material. I could go back on these these uh, podcasts and, and figure some things out where it's a lot more fluid. And because I don't find, I don't particularly uh, enjoy, uh, or well, not that I don't enjoy, I just don't do enough of the writing. You know what I'm saying? Like I come up with shit, but then I forget. I forget. Like, you know, I'm telling myself, oh, tonight I'm doing this. And then I'm just like, oh, shit, I forgot, you know? So I think yeah. that's a certain discipline that if you're not a comic, you don't realize that, like, people from the outside, you know, it's like, that should be quite so much discipline to create and, and be okay with, with taking those licks and, but, you know, standing around and keep on pushing the pen and creating new content. Well, you're a guy who obviously, uh, knows the boxing world and, and uh, you know, trains and, and is involved in all of that. So it's very much like, you know, I, I was a, a music major in college. I was a jazz piano major. So, you know, like these different worlds that we're in, you take parts of those disciplines and you apply them to stand up now, you know? So like, just like you would with boxing, if you have a deficiency that you know needs work, you know, you just concentrate on that. And, and yeah. over time, you know, it, maybe it won't be immediate, but uh, uh, over a course of six months, over a year, yeah. five years, you're going to see those things improve. So if you know, like, well, here are my strengths, you know, and I, I, I'm secure with those things. And here are the things that I, that I could stand to, to work on and concentrate on. You know, it's like a process, man. So it's like over the years, we're adding more tools and you, you know, you're doing a lot. And also there's no accident. I always feel like there's no accidents when you hook on with Giannis and Angelo, like two, you know, legends, two great guys, yeah. funny guys doing important special work. And you're right there in the mix with them because yeah. you're, you're hilarious, you're funny, you're unique, special. So like, there's no accidents to where you find yourself and you're doing the, the podcast, you're doing all these things. And then, you know, before you know it, you know, maybe it'll be two years, maybe it'll be five. Everything kind of comes together. And, you know, and also you're a father, you know, you're putting all these pieces together. So it's, yeah. there's a lot to, to figure out as you go. But um, yeah, I always try to just take an honest look at myself and say like, all right, even if there's one thing that I could kind of improve these next couple of months uh, and just, you know, you got to be patient with yourself too. You can't be too hard on yourself. Yeah. And then you see, you see the growth, man. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah. journey, right? Yeah, no, yeah, you're, you're totally right. And that's sound advice, advice, that's sound advice. And I, um, yeah, and I'm having a lot of fun doing it all. And I think that's the thing about stand-up that you got to love because you're always going to be checked. You know, you're always going to feel like, and there's something about our personalities that's attracted to that kind of like, I guess, not danger, you know, that's being dramatic, but that kind of like, oh, you know, you got to be, you got to be on point. You got to yeah. be like sharp, you know? Yeah, and, and you know, it's funny too, because like, if I take it on the chin uh, and I was prepared and sharp and excited and in a good headspace, I, I can deal with that. You know, like I kind of came with my best, I was ready and it just wasn't my night, whatever. I mean, I'll, I'll still think about it and maybe I'll listen back or whatever. But if I kind of came in a little bit like lethargic or a little bit kind of maybe overconfident and unprepared, and then I take it on the chin. Then I then I know it's on me. Like I, I wasn't really, um, I wasn't you know focused the way I need to be. So like those kind of moments are good. Like you talked about when we get you know we get uh, we kind of get ourselves checked a little bit to be like you got to make sure you're doing your work and you're you're coming with the right uh, you know the right energy. Right, right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is just that. And different different people have a different approach to it. You know. I um I like to go into certain things without many surprises. 
You know, I like to know what's going on. Like, if I'm on the road with Chris or something, I don't like to know last minute that there's no host. I want to know that I'm going to open up, like, all those little things. I just like to know, give me 24 hours. Just so I can wrap my head around, you know, look at the venue, maybe read the paper and see what's going to be, uh, what's going to charm the crowd in, in, in this place that's foreign to me if I know a little something internally. You know, I just want to know that little tricks, you know, it's like preparation. I want to know this shit. But if I go to this venue, it's like, yeah, uh, yeah, we, we have one mic and it's cordless and it's kind of been going in and out and you're going to crack it open and you're going to do like, whatever it's like what you know i don't like that shit five minutes before the show no like no <laughs> yeah i mean that's part of stand-up is we we've done a million of those types of shows <laughs> yeah 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 and, and, and Ted, i've had enough <laughs> yeah. i don't like doing those <laughs> you and me both man yeah but that's another that's another part of like keeping us on our toes right yeah, like you yeah. can never get too big or you can never be like <laughs> I'm above this shit. It's like, nah, man, like you, the mic's not working. You gotta like, you gotta yell. I had that happen. I was doing a gig with Jim. Uh, it was a stadium. It was a hockey arena. And the mic cut out. I'm in an arena. It's not a bar show. And oh my uh, God. so I had to do, you know, I had to like yell. Cause I mean, like at first I kind of played with it and joked around whatever and kind of just, you know, took my time with it because it was so bizarre and the crowd was laughing. And, you know, anytime they're laughing, you're like, all right, <laughs> let, let them laugh. Um, but then, you know, like I started like kind of just doing some jokes really slow and loud. And I said, uh, I'm going to have to take this real slow and I'm going to pause for you guys to laugh and then I'll start up again. <laughs> so, you know, I did a couple of jokes like that and then they fixed the mic, you know, but like, you know, maybe... 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I, I wouldn't have known what to do. I would have been scared or just walked off stage or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but you just have, you know, you've, whatever it is, you, you, that's part of the job, right? You figure right. it out. Right. No, it's so funny. You just walk off the stage. I remember my first paid uh, corporate gig, I was actually doing, I was uh, working for a catering company and the lady was so nice. She was like, you do stand-up comedy? Why don't you, this is the, my, the, my boss of the catering. She said, we have a corporate event for Lord and Taylor. Why don't you do a little stand-up thingy for them? <laughs> I was like, um, you know, I was like a year in, you know, and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, um, is it paid? The audacity, right? She's like, yeah, well, give me five. Well, you know, I'm sure they'll have a budget for 500 bucks. 500 bucks a year in? Yeah. You know? Dogs. The Lord and Taylor uh, attendees had no idea there was stand up. It was a loft with the elevators in the middle of the venue, so it was a circular motion. Uh -huh. uh, oh, yeah. Bar, uh, a cocktail hour on one, and then it did like a sit down, then on the other. And out of nowhere, the DJ's like, DJ Reddy Red from New Jersey or something. He had like a hat. I just remember he had like a hat, just a big, you know, DJ fedora hat, and he tried <laughs> to set me up. He was like, everybody, all right, we're going we're gonna to do, do something a little different, guys. Get around. And people are just walking by. I'm under a chandelier, no stage. <laughs> the, DJ, the, the DJ energy is so opposite of comedy energy because they're like, bow, 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 yo, you know, like, and then you come out like, uh. yeah, yeah. And I had like <laughs> three shitty jokes. I, I was, was going to try to stretch out the five minutes and 10 minutes because of a 10 minute spot. Yo, yeah. I walked out. It was awful, bro. That I was hung over for like two weeks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Under a chandelier. It was awful. But so Lord. funny. So yeah. Funny. Now, now I know I like if I was face, I would probably just say no, like nah, I can't do that. I'm busy. I'm yeah, busy. yeah. Well, those kind of gigs are like kind of like I don't know, they're they're perfect for when you're starting because you feel like it's showbiz in some sense, like, oh, I got hired for like a corporate gig, you know, like I'm a real working comedian, you know? Uh, like I remember when I was, I, it, it, it reminded me when I was still teaching, I was a, a New York City public school music teacher for five years. And I, so maybe I was like 29 years old, 28. And the principal, you know, I, I had done Conan like that year. So I was leaving teaching at the end of the year. It was like my last year teaching. But the principal awesome. asked me, uh, you know, we're having like a teacher's uh, retreat. Um, 
would you be willing to do stand up at the at the teachers retreat now you and i both know the answer to that question should be no <laughs> but for whatever reason i said yeah I'll, I'll do i'll do 20 minutes whatever and i think they paid me like 250 bucks or whatever but like i should have known like the working environment is more important than that 250 bucks. Like I don't want to bomb in front of my, my oh. colleague and then come in on Monday. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you know, I did it and it was like, it was just like, they, they knew me from, it's like, Oh, there's the lady that I, you know, uh, like uh, she teaches the third grade and now I'm like telling my joke. <laughs> <laughs> about being single you know like so weird. we're in this little room and uh yeah so i mean it, it wasn't like i bombed <laughs> but it was like uncomfortable you know yeah 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 and then the, you know i'd rather just like i'd rather have a hardcore bomb and just know what it was than that oh my god that was so good you know that was interesting i didn't know you had a dog and I'm like, what? <laughs> yes or they're like oh so you do comedy like after, after <laughs> After you just did comedy, they're like, oh, so you do comedy? It's like, yeah, I, that was it. That was, that was comedy. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. It's so true. Oh, my God, you do comedy. Oh, that's great. Right. Oh, oh man. man. It, it makes perfect sense that, um, that you have a history of music because I feel a lot of your material kind of ties into music. Or whether you know you had this great bit about uh the recorder i love that bit the Thank devil's you. instrument that's one of my favorite bits from you yeah. and i always feel like you intertwine songs as well like you know yeah yeah the la bamba <laughs> bit la bamba yeah it's funny because over the years i have a bunch of bits i do one about uh the words to la bamba and not you know i didn't realize and that was a true story i was just at like this bar that was they had karaoke at the bar i you know i was like watching a basketball game and somebody was singing karaoke and they were singing La Bamba and the words came up on the screens and it's, I always thought it was like ba -da -da -da, La Bamba <laughs> and it came up like para, by, para bailar and I didn't know that, you know, so I just right. like, you know, the way it is, it, certain things kind of strike you funny. So I, I wound up writing this whole bit about uh, La Bamba, you know. Right, right. It, it, it's, it's so funny. It's so relatable because... I would say 90% of the songs I sing, especially from like the 70s or 80s, are like that. Like I butcher the words. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I have another bit now that I do about uh, going through uh, erectile dysfunction, but I wind up singing uh, the song from Beauty and the Beast in the, in the bit. Um, right, right. You know, like what, uh, oh, perhaps there's something there that wasn't there before, like a Disney song, you know? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, it's just kind of, I did a lot of like musical theater when I was in high school and college. I did all these plays and stuff. And then uh, I, I majored in jazz piano in college. So I think I'm kind of, you know, I took piano lessons from the time I was like six. So uh, I'm kind of hardwired a little bit to, to think musically at times. And like, sometimes it's like the perfect punchline to just like go into a little singing thing or like yeah, yeah, something, yeah, yeah. something bizarre, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My daughter's playing piano and, uh, she has two very different instructors. She has one young Asian woman or Asian woman who is very, uh, very soft spoken and, you know, and, and it's a half hour or 45 minutes a week, you know, and she go, we take her to her house. And then we have another guy at the third street music school, but he's a, he's, he's an old head. You know, he probably has a history. He was probably like in some real fly shit. You know, I should look him up. It's so dirtbag that I'm talking about him. But something tells me, something about his energy tells me, he's like, how did I fucking end up here teaching six-year-old kids how to do piano? <laughs> in no way does it feel like he's frustrated by any, you know, it doesn't feel like that. Right. What it does feel like is it's like he knows his shit. And he's he has a certain way of teaching. Right. And it's a little more like hard-nosed, like, no, we gotta do this, and we're not moving on. You hear what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> and that's what it is. Like, no, there's no other way. You know, and I don't know. If my daughter is um, <laughs> likes that style. Oh, she doesn't like it. I, I, don't, I don't think she likes that style. I'm like, now you're gonna play that until it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the younger girl kind of moves around. They, oh, we'll move on. Let's. Here's a picture of a piano. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny because I, I was actually teaching piano lessons for a time 
when I, uh, you know, like when I had graduated college, I was teaching, you know, maybe three days a week. I had like a part-time gig at some public school in Queens. So I was there like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I, you know, just to kind of make some extra money, I was teaching piano lessons at my house. So I had like, you know, maybe three or four students, but you know, it was funny to see the different like kids that would come in. Some were kids, some were actually even adults, like, you know, maybe they were 20, 21. Um, but the different approaches, you know, like the kids that weren't really into it, like the, the, their mom just made them do it or whatever. I would just kind of be more like, here's a picture of a piano. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Let's just get through this, you know, right, but right, the right. that were into it, you know, then I would, uh, you know, we would dig in a little more. Right, right. It's, it's always interesting. Like, so when I take her on the weekends, there's other students, right? And they, they share the, the space and with the one instructor who's like the, the, the one that's like, now we're not moving on. And there's some annoying moms who come in, probably that have a little piano background. And they're like challenging the fucking instructor, the teacher. I'm like, let him do his thing. She's like, well, I'm just, it's interesting how you do that. Like she was doing all that shit, you know, like, you know, and I don't know what annoyed me more. The fact that she was challenging this, you know, the guy's an older guy. He knows his shit. I trust him. I like his vibe. I like his energy. But, you know, when someone comes and has got the closed mouth smile and the fact that she has a, she has a butt that's this big, for some reason that annoys me that my view of her, I'm standing with my child. It's like, this is a woman who's this skinny with a butt this big. It annoys me. I'm infuriated. <laughs> you ever see that? Like you meet someone who's not only are you being annoying, but your butt is obnoxious. You have a a a, a, a one year old butt. <laughs> it's it's funny how somebody's body can irritate you, right? <laughs> <laughs> On top of the fact that you're being obnoxious to this guy, your butt is really annoying too. <laughs> yeah. How do you think uh, about that thing? Which comes first? I think you have to be annoyed by the person because then, like, then you start picking apart their body. <laughs> If you like the person, you're like, all right, you uh, you know, you got a small butt, but I can deal, <laughs> I can deal with it. Oh man, yeah. If I don't like you, man, and you have earlobes that connect to your jawline, oh fuck you, man, fuck you. You can't act like that. You got earlobes that connect to your jaw. You all, you, that you don't deserve. You don't have that right. Yes, yes. Or someone who's just like, okay, it's another perfect example. If you're like online somewhere, right, and the person is just, you know, they're not moving. They're not aware. And then top it all off, they got like a double chin. They're like, mm, mm, on their phone. Mm. Oh, that pisses me off. Now you got a double chin on your phone like this. Mm, mm. You know, now, <laughs> not only are you holding up the line, but you got a double chin and short arms. Oh, yeah. If, if I'm annoyed, I will dissect your whole being, you know, like, I will scrutinize your, your, your hair, your eyebrows, like everything. Like, <laughs> we'll get into all of it. <laughs> that's why you got that one eyebrow hair that, that, that just sticks out and it's been like that for five years. I never told you anything, but it's, it's a thing and it's, it's wiry and fucking annoying. Yes. If you can fix to me, your personality, if oh, you fix ahead. your personality, then I'll overlook the eyebrow. Right, right. <laughs> that happened to me one time I was, uh, I was at a uh, at Laugh Lounge. Remember Laugh Lounge? We used to work there. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, spent a lot of time there. Yeah, there was a heckler, and she was nasty, man. And it was like It was one of Bert Smooth's show. Bert Smooth had more of like a you know a younger you know uh, you know African American crowd. You know a lot of Latinos in the mix. So it was a young black you know Latino crowd, right? And you know the energy is different, right? It's like uh, you know it's it's a late night show and in the front row, there was uh, three white people. There was, uh, it was a couple and a white girl. And the white girl seemed visibly drunk. And she was heavy set. And she was just looking at me like this. And I'm doing well with this audience who's like super animated, young. You know, like, oh, you know, I'm doing well. And um, she, go, she looks at me and she goes, fuck off. Yeah, out of nowhere, Ted. I wasn't talking to her. She was like, fuck off. And, <laughs> and she was like, oh, what's that? And I, like, I had a notepad in my back. I wasn't looking at notes. This happens to be my joke book. Like, and she's like, why don't you pull out a funny joke from the back of your pocket? I know you write this stuff. <laughs> and, then, and, then, yeah. and then this young black girl comes out. I know what she said. 
I don't even know why she's trying to do it to herself. You know, she she knows he's a comedian. Why is she? So now I got that going, going, going at each other. Yeah. Yeah, but she's like, luckily that that girl's on my side, and the audience is like with me because the girl's fucking up the show. So yes. I told her, I said, um, I said you got. You got, I'm gonna give you like one more chance to like be quiet so I could proceed because I don't want to like destroy you. Like I said something like that, which by the way, I probably would never handle a heckler that well again in my life. This is a long time ago. I don't know if I have that in me because she kept on going on and on. Yeah. And I said, what do you do for a living? Just so happy she was a teacher. Huh. And I was like, you're a teacher? With those flabby ass arms, she was real heavy. So she had, I said, so every time you, you write on the board, that flab is just slapping you in the back of your face. So I did the act out, you know, on that on that job back, uh, that backdrop of the laugh lounge. Yeah, yeah. The crowd was with me. Oh, you know, I think I even heard a, a table flip. <laughs> like, you know, it's possible. Laugh, had like those cafeteria style. <laughs> yeah, they could have turned that over easy. <laughs> And the crowd was oh, on her, and she was so pissed. And every time she says something, I think I would do a fart noise. Like, I'm, I was just childish. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, though, I, that was years ago. But that's what happened. Like, she annoyed me, and then I went, anything that I didn't like physically, it was just more amplified. But I didn't feel good about that. It, it, it felt good to win, but I also felt like I got to a fight with someone I knew. And I was thinking about it, like for days on end. I was like, "Why did that happen? What did I do that turned her off? Was she just yeah. drunk?" And it, it, it stuck with me for a yeah. while. It's funny you bring that up, right? Because sometimes you you win in the sense of like, you know, the crowd laughs and you get the room back, but it feels like a loss because you uh, you kind of cut somebody down, and you know, especially somebody who's got flab flabby arms. <laughs> You know, and it's like you're, you're attacking that? them. Maybe they're drinking because they hate their job and they have flabby arms. <laughs> and, yeah, right. You know what I mean? And I, I've been there too where, like, you just, uh, you know, and, and stand-up is such a um, such an in-the-moment kind of thing, and it depends on what kind of day you had as a comedian. Right. Sometimes you're not in the mood. You're, right. you're tired. You're pissed off already when you get there. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of factors that contribute but then sometimes that moment happens and even if, yeah, even if the crowd laughs and it feels like you won, I, I remember plenty of times where I'm on the subway going home or I'm driving home and I just feel like, ah, oh, man, I, did, I didn't handle that. That's the worst feeling where you, and it does stay with you for, it stays with you for days because you yeah. think about it. You're like, what could I have done differently? You know, cause you don't yeah. want to like, you know, if as a good comedian, unless you're like a roast comic or that's your thing, uh, but even roast comics don't really make it too personal, you know, like to yeah. really cut somebody down, you know? Right. Uh, but yeah, like you want, you want people leaving feeling good, you know? Right, 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 right. Um, I definitely, I definitely felt that. And I guess that's the difference, right? Cause it was like a personal attack on like <laughs> on physical makeup rather than making fun of the fact that she was just being obnoxious. I was making fun of earlobes. Or, eyelashes <laughs> you're like actually that's what's on my notebook in my back <laughs> i've been keeping a list of all your physical deformities <laughs> oh man it's so funny wild wild yeah I, I have, so uh if you're in a situation like that uh have you ever like has, has there been a time recently where you felt like you stepped out your character like you just it wasn't even about, here's a, a witty response. <laughs> you just get mad. <laughs> yeah, I remember years ago. I mean, this is going back like 15. Getting mad on stage is, is, is the worst. And, but I, I do enjoy not watching a, a friend of mine, but every now and then a good meltdown. It's good oh, yeah. entertainment. <laughs> As a comic, seeing another As comic a... just have a complete meltdown. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. Yeah, because it happens to everybody. So sometimes... You're just in the room and you like you call everybody like <laughs> <laughs> it's happened, it's on. It's, it's on. <laughs> but yeah, I had one like maybe uh, you know, 15, 17 years ago, where I was it was like kind of like one of my early headlining ones, I think. So maybe it was 17, 18 years ago, if I could, if I remember correctly. Um Yeah, and, and you know, uh, 
you know, yeah, headlining, if it's early on, man, you know, you probably want things to go smooth. You're doing 45 minutes to an hour, probably at a club, you don't, you, you know, whatever. Like, you just it want to like, be cool. It was on the Jersey Shore somewhere, you know, like some kind of like club where, you know, people, they're there for vacation. They're, they're not there for a comedy club. Um, and this drunk woman, it was the same kind of thing. And I, I remember I just like, snap, like you said, when you're starting to headline, you just have blinders on. It's like, I want to remember these jokes. I want to get through this. Like, it'd be better if you just, everybody is silent. <laughs> I prefer silence to any kind of interruptions. <laughs> but this That's woman, why I love doing comedy on Zoom. I don't get any response. Just let me say my shit. I can headline on any Zoom comedy show. <laughs> as long as everybody's muted, I'm good. I could do a tight 45. <laughs> I'll, I'll run to the check spot and all that. I'll handle all that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, man. When we get back to the clubs, it's going to be like, can somebody mute that table, man? <laughs> but I, I uh, yeah, I had this woman that interrupted like literally my first five jokes. She was so oh. drunk. I don't know if it was like a bachelorette party. So or birthday it was party. early on. It was early in your set. It was early in my set, you know, I had just gotten up there. I'm ex I think I, my brother and one of my best friends from childhood actually came down. Of course. Like, you know, so they, they, they came down to see the show. We were going to hang out for the weekend. And I wound up calling this woman a cunt, like in the first <laughs> five minutes. And like, just, you know, and I was angry too. You know, when you're, like you said, when you're angry and it's not even like funny, <laughs> I just like yeah. lost it. And then I had to do another 40 minutes after that. <laughs> oh, God. Jesus. Yeah, it was it was brutal, man. But that was that was one that I still remember to this day of feeling like that was on me. Like no matter how drunk she was and no matter how disruptive she was, uh I didn't handle that right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, at some point, man, I'm like, I'm getting back up. I'm not gonna, you know, <laughs> just okay, security. <laughs> yes. Please <laughs> yeah. remove this, like just fucking do that instead because yeah, man. Uh, the cunt, you know, when a you know, word like, like, like it's a hole, it, it's hard to get out that hole. Yeah, yeah, it is hard. Yeah, and it's hard. <laughs> yeah, because it's like you bring a uh, an atom bomb <laughs> to a situation that calls for like peace talks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, right. it's like let's see if we can have a dialogue and figure this out, and then you just you go right to the to the the bomb, man. You know, it would have been great if you would have had like a harmonica in your back pocket and just after you said kind of <laughs> I would, would love strike me as a type that could pull you could have pulled that off, man. Just fucking I wish I had, I wish I had thought of that. Because I think about like I never thought about like musical comedians if they have those kind of moments. At least then they can like, you know, pick up the guitar and after they call somebody a cunt, then they're like, all right, you know. They go on to like their musical parody song. And, and close your eyes. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or, or you could just drown them out, right? If, pe if there's a noisy table or whatever. Uh, I remember working with this musical act who played the keyboard and he had that thing so loud. This was like, you know, I was middling. Right. And this guy was headlining some room in Jersey and he had his keyboard so loud that like, nobody could even hear themselves think or he, he never got heckled never got disrupted because it, it was just like bombarding them <laughs> <laughs> yeah there wasn't like even the slightest opening for anybody to, to heckle and i was like oh okay that's one approach <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty fucking funny man yeah. just turn that shit up and he's just looking at them like that yeah you can't do anything this yeah. yeah, they're like holding their ears. <laughs> oh man. Real quick before we before we wrap up, this is something new I'm trying. You love music. Give me one dirtbag song. What's a dirtbag song that maybe you didn't even realize was a dirtbag song? But you love this song? It's like, yo, that's a dirtbag song. <laughs> <laughs> it could be any genre. I'm flexible. <laughs> yeah. A dirtbag song. I mean, it's not really like dirtbag, but it wasn't really my genre. Um, you know, like that, like 80s cheese rock, like uh, pour some sugar on me and all that shit. It's yeah. kind of dirtbaggy. It's, 
<laughs> you know, it's not like. Uh, What's, wait, is that the name of the song? Pour some sugar on me. Pour some sugar on me. Oh yeah, I love it. You got a good voice too, man. <laughs> I set you up. That's what I was trying to do. See? <laughs> Yeah, man. I, honestly, I don't know those are the words. <laughs> it's it's actually la ba da 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 la mama. <laughs> that is a dirtbag song. You know, it, I, it, it amazes me that some people is like, this is a song, and it's like a serious thing. They go into a meeting with some executives, and they're like, yeah, I got this new song. What do you got for us, Frederick? And he's like, <laughs> Put it in your mouth, in your motherfucking mouth. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Can <laughs> we get a piano on that? <laughs> yeah. Remember that song? <laughs> put there it in your a, mouth? Yeah. <laughs> there was a song called Put It In Your Mouth. And you should know this because you're from Queens. It was an artist by the name, a rap artist, of course, by the name of Akinelli. And the name of it, it was about fellatio. And it was a very aggressive song, Ted. It's <laughs> that is aggressive. That's like, yeah, that's beyond dirtbag. But check it out. It, it, the lyrics read, put it in your mouth, in your motherfucking mouth. And that was it. And that was the hook. And it will always close out the, the clubs I went out to. Like, that was the last song. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> At like 3 a.m., like, that's the song. We're going to clear this area out with that song. You don't want to play that too early in the night. <laughs> back when i first started djing just like a like standing a stand-up comedy that yeah that'd be a mistake opening up with that bit right <laughs> right right you, you got to make sure they're on your side before you <laughs> break out and put it in your right? mouth you can't pay, put it in your mouth and have the people like walking by you know and, and, and by a buffet i'm like no i don't think he's talking about that in the lyrics <laughs> <laughs> right right that is a dirtbag song by Akinelli. Please don't do it with a kid and the wife are around, but look up Akinelli, put it in your mouth, and I'm gonna report back to you. I will. I will. Yeah, we we gotta we gotta uh yeah, we gotta check in on the Akinelli and then we check in on the uh the type of snake my brother has. There we go. We got, I got some homework. You got some homework, you got some homework to do, Ted. I do. I didn't realize Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Yo, thank you so much for doing this, brother. Oh, Everyone sorry. Uh, listening, make sure you tune in to Stay at Home Comedian. It's a special that my man said this job is gonna be a lot of fun. And going to archives, man, digging deep, he's actually absolutely one of my favorites. It's gonna be one of yours. And um, I want you to throw the platform you want people to harass you on. Thanks, Serge. And before I do, let me thank you, man. I'm a big fan of yours and uh, love your stuff, man, and, and just have, have loved watching you come up and, and uh, do your thing for years now. So uh, always great to spend some time with you. Yeah, and man, people, I had a lot of fun. Thank you, man. Oh, for, sure, for sure. Yeah, people can find me uh, at Ted Alexandro on Instagram, Twitter, uh, TedAlexandro.com. And my special stay-at-home comedian is available for free on YouTube, Instagram, uh, IGTV, uh, Facebook, I decided to make it free, but I'm fundraising for this, uh, this organization, COVID Bailout NYC. Uh, they pay people's bail who are stuck in jail and haven't had any trial yet. So they haven't been convicted of anything, but they just can't afford to pay their bail. Uh, so this organization, COVID Bailout NYC, they pay people's bail, get them reunited with their family. And especially now during coronavirus, uh, it's spreading in the jails faster than anywhere in the world. So uh, the people at, at COVID bailout are doing really good work to get people back home. Oh, awesome, man. Thanks for sharing, man. And, you know, <clears throat> this is a whole other thing, but I do have to say, um, as a, a comedian, the utmost respect, but also I've always reached out to you when I, um, you, you're always so progressive and you're just like, an advanced human being in my eyes. You're such a compassionate person who loves people and you're like a fighter for, for, for a lot of people. So I appreciate that. Your mom and dad did a phenomenal job with you. I gotta meet your parents, man, because I know they're, they're responsible for the way you move and how progressive you are, man. You're, you're an absolute pleasure, man. I hope, I hope you live a very long time, Ted. Um, I, I intend to, Serge. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I just, I have a podcast called A Little Bit Me and I did an episode with my mom and dad just, oh, uh, just no. last week. Yeah, so 
you got to listen to that. I interviewed okay. my mom and dad, and uh, I think it'll give you a glimpse into uh, good or bad how I turned out. <laughs> Perfect, man. I'm so happy that you remembered to tell me that. Awesome, man. Thank You're the you. man. We're going to sign off. Thank you for tuning into the DBS podcast. My man, Ty Alexandro, thank you so much. And I'll see you sooner than later, Pop. Thank you, Serge. Appreciate it, All brother. Right, Take care. You too.